<laughs> let's let's just kick this off. All right, we're back with um well with a follow up with Meredith Rawls. She is an astronomer at the University of Washington. She's a research scientist at the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, um, which in itself houses the LSST, the Legacy, Sur Legacy Survey of Space and Time. That's a tough one for me to speak. Um, and uh, thanks for coming back. You bet. Glad to be here. That's awesome. So end of May, we talked about the the implications of uh, big lower Earth orbit satellite constellations on astronomy. Um, and there are several constellations up there, but of course the big elephant in the room is, in that context, is uh, always SpaceX, because they have almost 3,000 satellites up there right now, and they're planning mm -hmm. to launch quite a few more. So a month ago in August, there was a, was a, um, a project and community workshop at... Uh, the observatory and SpaceX. Well, it was it was outside Tucson, but it was for Rubin Observatory. It was for Rubin, but um, mm -hmm. the well, and SpaceX gave a gave an update there on mm -hmm. their plans um, for mitigating the brightness. So, in g just a general question to kick this off: uh, sure. Has anything changed in the last three months from from the uh, astronomy side of? Things have you found better ways to mitigate satellite streaks and that kind of stuff? So we haven't magically solved anything. Um, we have this been is working not gone? on. <laughs> yeah, it's fine now. Don't worry about it. Um, we have been working on multiple angles um, to kind of address the issue. Um, so there, there, I don't even know which one to begin with. So there's a new International Astronomical Union Center uh, for the what's it called? The protection of the dark and quiet sky. Uh, from satellite constellation interference, and it actually exists now. And we're taking, um, uh, we are accepting applications for new members to join us. It's free and open to anyone. Um, it's taking us a little time to process the applications, but we have a Slack workspace, and we're beginning to coordinate some observations. And I'm co-chairing the Sat Hub wing of that, which is all about data and observations and trying to get a handle on the brightness. So it's been really heartening to see some folks beginning to contribute to that, and. So is, is, I is that yeah, this, this this official body body kind of thing that we talked about last time? That was yep. I think yep, it was yep. called it was CPS. It was just kind of almost getting started. Yeah, CPS. Right, yeah, because yeah, because exactly. I found the link that 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 uh, worked a while ago doesn't work anymore. So oh, so it's um, just um, cps.iau.org. Okay, all right. and it's actually kind of a nice looking website now. <laughs> yeah, the first one was. Let me let me check. Oh, this looks so much nicer now. Yeah. All right. Good. Yeah, so you can you can click through the different tabs there, and 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 Sat Hub at the top is the one that I'm involved with. Uh, All right. So we have we have a lot of plans. Uh, we don't have a lot of funding yet, but we're uh, we at least have our work uh, underway, and we're kind of defining our priorities and and getting people uh, set up to coordinate with each other. So that's been really really heartening. Um, the other thing that I that has changed in the last few months is I, I did a couple of summer projects that kind of pertain to the realm of satellite constellations and astronomy. One of them was more Rubin specific. Um, I had the opportunity to work with an undergraduate from Harvey Mudd College, which is actually where I went to college. So that was kind of fun. And it was fully remote uh, through this uh, distance or distributed REU summer research program. It's a U.S. thing, research experience for undergraduates. And and she worked with me to, and also my colleague Peter at University of Washington, to come up with a, a, tech, a simulation of how effectively Rubin could dodge satellites, right? So there's going to be, like, Rubin doesn't take um, requests from the community for what a point. It has a, a scheduler algorithm that kind of, like, predetermines like, okay, well, we haven't visited this part of the sky recently, so we better go here. Or, oh, you know, we need to get some more observations in the G filter uh, over in this region next. Or, oh, it was cloudy here, so we got to make up over here. Or, oh, the galactic plane is amazing, so let's hammer this a bit, right? And, it, and oh, well, it's, you know, the moon is up, so we should go over here instead, right? It optimizes for all these different things. So we were like, given that there's this optimization framework, let's throw in satellites and see if okay. we tell the scheduler try to avoid satellites like how that would affect a simulated observing plan 
So that, that was summer project that she worked on with me. So so does that mean if someone requests uh, time on the telescope, the, the scheduler would come back and say, sorry, not a good idea. You might want to shift this for 30 minutes or something along those yeah, lines. Yeah, well, there's not really a mechanism for requesting time in the telescope. Ah, okay. it's, it's an overall trying to get all the science goals kind of baked into one. And sure, we'll adjust it as we go, but it's, you know, you... Um, so it'll, it'll, it'll cannot, spit out a timetable yeah. pretty much a schedule and then um, yeah it talks directly to the telescope and says okay and that, that will now try now to and, right and that will now try to take into account uh satellite well so we, we we tried it we we did an experiment to see what what how that would work and unfortunately we found that it's almost certainly not worth it to try to dodge satellites unless they're extremely bright and like could saturate the detector which none of the spacex ones are that bright so but the reason is that you spend so much time like slewing the telescope out of the way that you get fewer exposures and you lose survey depth. And the whole oh. point of Rubin is to get like maximized survey depth. So it's it's better to it's at, at this stage, given what we know now, it's better to just take the hit with having to deal with, you know, knowing there's gonna be streaks near images, assuming they're not super duper bright, than it is to try to play like whack a mole, so to speak. Uh, you just lose too much time slowing over the sky. All right. So, yeah. So having, having that was, the streaks, that was one summer project that I led. What's that? So, sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, having having the streaks in there is is there a, a simple way to mathematically take care of them? Like, is the are you are you now doing more more stacking, more auto detection of streaks and removing those? pictures or parts of the pictures? How does this work? Sure. So we have a, a, an algorithm in the Rubin Science Pipelines that my colleague Claire has written that does that for the stacked images. It can find the streaks. It can remove the streak from the single image. I mean, that's not super new. That was in place a few months ago. Right. Uh, but what we haven't done yet is try to add that to the real-time processing pipeline, the alert production pipeline that I work on. And that's kind of on my list of things that I need to work on eventually. Um, I'll be taking a parental leave this fall, so I probably won't be working on that anytime in the immediate future, but it's absolutely on our radar um, to try to try to get that you know refined and working better in different situations and tested a little more robustly. Um, but you know the, the basic mechanism for detecting a streak and, um, and deciding what you want to do with it, uh, we understand reasonably well. And I actually led another summer project um, more around streak detection in images. This was less Rubin specific because we're starting to collect a pile of images that are known to contain satellite streaks with this Trailblazer service that now exists. It's very beta, but you can go to trailblazer.direct.dev uh, and there's a real website now that you can upload FITS files that happen to have streaks in them. And the upload may fail because we may not be able to handle your specific telescope instrument yet, but then we'll get a log and we can, you know, on our copious free time, we can go and fix it so that it can accept that in the future. But the idea is that we have now a, a small collection of images that are known to contain streaks that we can start to say, okay, how can we write software that can find the streak robustly, even though all these images have their own idiosyncrasies, right? Because different background levels, you know, they either have or haven't been reduced um, the streaks can sometimes be a little bit glinty. They can be really bright or really faint or on the edge, right? All kinds of weird situations. And so I worked with a team of students at the University of Washington's East Science Institute through the uh, Data Science for Social Good program this last summer. Um, my colleague Dino and I led a team of three on, uh, three students, two undergraduates, one uh, uh, master's student. And none of them were astronomers. So it was really cool to kind of get some interdisciplinary uh, expertise, but also be like, oh, all these things that I know I need to explain to you. <laughs> it was good right. for everyone, truly. Really. Um, but by the end of the summer, they actually had a, a robust prototype for being able to take a Fitz image and find the streak in it and like validate that it probably really is a streak. And then uh, do a very preliminary brightness measurement. We didn't quite get as far as like proper photometry with magnitudes and such. Are but that's, we, that would be the next step for that. Are, are we talking like procedural algorithms or is this more of a of an AI kind of thing where you train an AI on the streak images and let it... It's not AI. Uh, it's th That would be maybe the next... That would be th an extension, right? Because we would, we would like to be able to maybe classify them later in sure. some sense. But right now it's, it's literally just streak or no streak, you know, here it is. Um, and so we, we use a, a, a Huff, a Huff, um, Huff line transformation. I think that's what it's called. 
uh, to detect the streaks, which is, is kind of a standard method in image processing. Right. Uh, but the, you know, the students had to learn about it and you know understand that images are really just two D arrays, and you know, so it was it was a fun a fun exercise. Sounds fun. Yeah, we, we have a public GitHub repository. Uh, for, it's called Satmetrics, and it's somewhere on GitHub. I could send you the link later. That um, that kind of has kind of a summary of all that work. That is, a, right. it's a good launching point for for kind of specializing it in different directions, including potential AI. Like, is there a streak or not? Or as we were starting, like there are streaks in these. Like, find them. <laughs> it's a slightly easier problem. Right. So back to SpaceX. They have oh, yes. their first general first generation satellites up there that are well, you, you now know their characteristics. Um they have uh announced They do this. keep changing things, but more or less. They are yeah, I, I believe they are they're changing things more than probably science wants them to. Um, well, most of the changes they're doing are actually or many of the changes they're doing are to try to make them darker, which we very much appreciate but and it's not yeah it's not always clear exactly what they're changing in real time they'll share the update later typically right and and now and now there was this meeting where they um announced their version two satellite mitigation techniques mm -hmm. um so if i if i get it correctly the they have a, a mirror a special mirror film that will help them direct the sun reflection away from earth in some way yeah, that's right. So they have uh, this new, I think it's like dielectric coating or something. I'm not a material scientist, but but basically it's a it's a very directionally reflective mirror coating so that it reflects the light strongly away from Earth as like so you know if you were standing over in the in the wrong direction you'd get blinded, but you know, most of our telescopes are on Earth, so that's probably fine. Right. And then then the it doesn't reflect much towards Earth is the idea because it has to go somewhere, right? Like you can't, right. it can't, if it absorbs the light, then it overheats. So by having a reflect, a, a very specular, they call it, or a very directional reflection, um, that is is a really pretty creative way to solve that. And uh, the and claim, I'm the claim seems to be ten times better at those ten times ten times lower brightness or something along those lines. That's the claim. Have you seen any? Sure, of yeah. So they've they've done some tests in the lab that show that it is a lot darker, which is awesome. Um, but these the generation two satellites are also going to be a lot bigger. Uh, oh yeah, I've so, heard that too. Yeah, larger surface area. Um, you know, I, 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 I do sincerely appreciate all of the engineering effort that they're putting in to try to make them darker. And I, you know, that's great because they, if they're too bright, we're really hosed. But they're still planning to launch a whole bunch of them, and we have yet to, you know, see a prototype and actually measure how bright it really is in various situations. Because even the, the generation one satellites that they, um, that we've been observing for a little while now. It, they can do surprising things, right? We found a random one that was having a really bright reflection as it was transiting the sky at like a random point. Uh, this was my colleague, Harry Krantz at Arizona, um, sent me a slide to share about this. And, you know, he was like, yeah, it was it was a kind of a normal Starlink pass, but then it got like really bright and then it faded out again. And then we actually talked to SpaceX and they were like, oh, well, that one... That one was doing a weird maneuver that was like not a standard thing, you know, just a one off. Don't worry about it. Uh, but you look at how many satellites they're talking about launching and, you know, it has to do this maneuver in order to like point the panels towards the sun and to get enough or no, maybe it was a no, it was a, it was a maneuver for um for or was it an invasive maneuver or something? <laughs> No, it wasn't. It wasn't for a crash. I don't think right. it was just because it needed to. It was at the part of its orbit or its lifetime where it needed to go up. They do raise orbit. orbits every now and then. Yeah. Exactly, and you have to orient in a certain way to do that. And so we just happened to observe this satellite at the moment it was orienting in a non-ideal way for astronomy, so so it could like do its thing. But you know, but it's interesting because they're like, oh well, that was not a normal operating situation, and I'm like, well. There's going to be thousands of these, tens of thousands tens of, of these. Th hundreds like, of thousands. Statistically, maybe. there's going to be like two dozen always doing a non-standard thing, yeah. you know. So it's it's challenging. Anyway, so so uh, version two sets the dielectric mm -hmm. mirror film. The they they also said they were, are doing some um, solar array mitigations in terms yeah, of like, like, like terminating kind of dark paint, like in between the solar panel. Uh, and, and, I th and I think they also want to tilt them when it when they go over the terminator, so that you yeah. don't get the. Excuse me. The... They've been doing that for a little while, actually. Already, um, during the launch phase, they put it on like a knife edge rotation, right. so that because they are the brightest shortly after launch, like there's 
you can't get around that. They're closest. They're still going up. They at least, you know, they, and they do sacrifice some power by doing this. They rotate it so that it's not um, reflecting as much sun as it would otherwise towards earth. And I think, so the, yeah, they were saying they're going to continue that practice in however it applies right. to the bigger Gen 2 satellites, which and is then they but. And then they developed some special black paint that is stable up there and that mm -hmm. the rest gets painted with something along those lines. So that's the good mm -hmm. side. I've also yeah. heard that uh, they still have, I mean, the, the, they will still have the phase after they've been put in space, the, the orbit rays kind of thing, yep. during which you will still have a well they do still have to get up there you know you can't beam them up there sadly that would be a uh, convenient well and then no, yeah there are there are <laughs> there are course correction maneuvers the orbit races yeah. and so that might make them brighter and then of course when they deorbit them that is another uh yeah thing. Very much so. and at this point my understanding is this is only a promise we haven't really seen anything yet the right they haven't launched our name generation two satellites yet right. but um you know, I I don't think that they're telling us this, and then they're gonna like throw it oh, no, out the window not. and laugh. But you know, it, it, it remains to be seen what it is in practice. You're absolutely right. It's all it's all I, theoretical um, until it's actually hardware that's up in space. Yeah. Um, one thing I found interesting is that they want to offer that film to that that uh, mirror film to other satellite operators. Mm -hmm. At, at I thought that was interesting something too. Something like that. Are they? Yeah. Are they? Do you know from other satellite operators if they want to take them up on that? I don't know. I haven't asked. I haven't had a chance to ask. Um, but I also am very curious to know if that's actually helpful for them or not. Uh, well, one challenge that I know uh, that, that we need to keep in mind is that SpaceX is a little bit unique because they do all of the phases of developing, designing, building, launching, operating the satellites all in-house. It's all SpaceX operations. But other satellite operators, they often will like order pre-made satellite hardware from like third-party companies okay. that are not even aware of these conversations or concerns about astronomy and so you know saying you know hey satellite company i want to sell you this coding well if they're like you know outsourcing their satellite hardware building to some third party that isn't going to buy the film that's a potential issue there hmm. all yeah. right so what what's your general gut feel Compared to like uh, three months ago, is this going the right direction? I mean, you probably, as an astronomer, aren't super happy about the whole satellite situation, but no, it's not. Nothing has surprised me really in the last few months. I'll say that much, right? Like this is basically the trajectory that I was seeing, um, short term unfold. Just you know, they're uh, they're going to keep launching kind of as much as they can, as fast as they can, because we don't have anything saying otherwise at this stage. And um, we're going to, you know, more astronomers are becoming aware that, you know, as Ruben in particular gets closer to operations, they're like, oh, what is this actually going to look like? We should figure that out. And I'm like, yes, we should. <laughs> but it's really hard to predict it because I don't know how many satellites will actually be in orbit for the decade that Ruben will be operating. It's, you know, and I talked to one colleague and they're like, oh, it's a totally unsustainable business model. They're going to all go bankrupt and there won't be any satellites that we have to worry about. Uh, during and I'm like uh, I don't, I don't actually want to take that bet because I don't want to lose it but <laughs> or, or you know what I mean I don't want to win it um anyway yeah, is that so. is that also that is that whole situation also helping to I don't know bring the the astronomical different corners of the astronomical world together is there some uh, I, I don't know I mean it's 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 not tearing us apart you know that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah, it is giving some opportunities for um for collaborations that might not otherwise happen. I will say it is still a very challenging uh funding landscape. Um as some colleagues and I put in a, a proposal to the NSF to try to get money for a postdoc at the University of Washington to work on some of this and we didn't get it. Uh which was frustrating because the grant that we applied for specifically was for dealing with satellites in some capacity. And we pretty clearly wrote a proposal that was we're the people that know how to deal with satellites and would like to actually pay someone to do that. And they were like, yeah, this definitely needs to happen. No, we're not going to fund it. So that was discouraging, but it's the grant it's academia and it's grants. So yeah. Yeah. That's the way it's set up, unfortunately. Yep. Yeah. And there's not that many, um, you know, most uh, NSF and NASA grants, uh, they really want some like innovative science 
to come out of it, right? They want like a new methodology or they want like an amazing new discovery potential or, right, which I love that stuff too. And, and, a, and a lot of what we really need to do to mitigate the satellite problem is a little more boring. <laughs> so, you know, you can't be like, we're going to design this amazing new algorithm to like, uh, you know, fix make all the it, images. Make it, make it yeah. AI, make it AI. That'll get you some money. AI is a big thing right now. I don't now. know, but... Yeah, so, so at the end of the day, sometimes you just need some people to actually write some basic software, and that's not an easy thing to get funded. That's very true. So, yeah. All right. So, um, I guess I guess I want to invite you back again once uh, once SpaceX has begun sending up their version two sats. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what the timeline happen. is for that. They're still working on getting their oh. like starship or spaceship or whatever it's called. Um, licensed, so no one knows. I don't know. But I think yeah. as soon as as soon as that is ready, they will probably start launching as quick as they can. That's the way yeah. they operate. So yeah. one thing we're also keeping our eye on is there's this um, that just I think in a couple days there's this new Blue Walker three um, set of small test satellites from a totally different company. I haven't heard. Um, of I don't, don't don't have it pulled up right now what the actual company is, but if you Google Blue Walker three test satellite, you'll probably find it. And these are uh, some kind of, I think, cell phone enhancing prototype, something or other. But they are going to be extremely bright. And so astronomers are kind of, there's not going to be very many of them, but they're going to be like saturating level extremely bright. Is I'm looking at a picture of them. They are huge. Yeah, they're like, it's like this field of white reflective wow. sadness. It's not quite your billboard in space, but it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> So, but they're they're launching a handful of them, I believe, this Saturday, and so that has been a bit of a rallying cry, most recently, of trying to get some folks with access to telescopes, like, you know, saying yes, I will absolutely observe this, and we can see just how bad it is, and you know, and then we can yell about it. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm that's that's probably part of your job now, ringing the alarm, yep. right? Yep, yep. Somehow, yep. <sighs> All right, and I'll 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 bring this I'll, I'll take this back into the photography community, and maybe they will. Yeah, uh, that'll be that'll be interesting. Raise, they will definitely show up in there. photos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, Meredith, thank you so much, and yeah, I'll Absolutely. I'll ping you again as soon as uh, SpaceX gets their version two ready. Sounds good.